Hello, dear listeners. Welcome to another episode of Follow Your Path. My name is Abdul Abed. I am a surgical pathology fellow at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and I'm delighted to welcome to our show today Dr. Ann Mills. She is an associate professor of pathology at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville, and she's also their residency program director. We are also joined today by a pathology resident, Shikha Malhotra. Welcome to the show, Dr. Mills. Great. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, starting off, can you uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, went to med school and residency? Sure. So I am from Charlottesville, Virginia. So I was actually born at the health system where I now work. So I'm a UVA baby. I went away for my undergraduate training um, just to get away from home. I went a couple hours east to the College of William and Mary and then returned here to UVA for medical school. I had a fairly unique reason um, about to, to leave UVA for residency, uh, which was that my dad, Stacy Mills, was actually the division head for anatomic pathology back then. And I thought it would be a little odd to train as a resident um, with my parent in a leadership position like that. So it was sort of a non-starter <clears throat> for me to stay at UVA, but as I tell all of my residency candidates, my reason doesn't apply to anyone else, so you should look at UVA. Um, but for me, it was, you know, for, for clear reasons, it made sense to broaden my horizons a bit. So I ended up going out west to Stanford. We have a really strong connection with Stanford. A lot of our faculty have trained there. And so uh, it was very highly recommended to me. I ended, ended up doing an away rotation um, and connecting with the residents and faculty really, really well out there. Um, so I ended up doing my APCP residency training in Palo Alto um, from 2008 to 2012. And then I returned back here to UVA to do my fellowships in cytopathology and then GYN and breast pathology um, under the GYN mentorship of Mark Stoller and the breast mentorship of Kristen Atkins. Oh, wow. And then joined the faculty here after those fellowships and have been here on faculty um, for seven or eight years now, I guess, so I'm going on eight years. Nice, wonderful. That's, that's great. I mean, I know as residents, it's really hard for us to decide what specialty to go into. So I'm curious to know, like, how did you settle upon uh, the specialty that you chose and whether there was like a specific person who inspired you? Yes, thank you. I love this question. So I actually went into pathology wanting to pursue GYN pathology. And I always tell applicants and junior residents that that is not, not required at all. You certainly don't have to have your mind made up. In fact, I think it's great to go into your training open-minded. Um, my path was, I think, kind of unique in that I really came to pathology through a love of GYN oncology. And for a time, had actually considered doing a GYN training, OBGYN training, but the obstetric side of it really didn't appeal to me. And I did find myself always chasing the specimens um, to, the, to the frozen section room um, rather than enjoying the retracting and uh, sort of surgical parts of the work. So my, my interest actually was sparked long before medical school though. Um, this is really going to date me, but back in the 90s uh, when the internet was not a big deal, <laughs> Most people didn't have it at their homes. And so I was a volunteer at UVA Health System. Um, I was like, you know, the old old school candy striper, right? I, I worked as a volunteer um, here as a, as a young teenager. And at that time, um, we could rotate through a variety of services as volunteers. I would work in the children's hospital and play with the kids some, and I would deliver flowers and gifts to patients. Um, but my favorite rotation was actually in this digital library that we had where um, because many patients did not have access to the internet or good resources at home back in the early 90s, we would be charged with um, looking up patient requests for more information and providing them with printed packets of information about their disease. So again, really dating me, but like there was no Dr. Google for most people back then. So someone would get a diagnosis and come to our little library, which again, no longer exists at UVA Health because everybody has the internet now. And we would get on the internet, it's fairly new and exciting, and come up with some nice resources that we would sort of vet and think were a good level for that patient. Um, and so in this work, finding resources for patients as a volunteer at, at UVA Health, I ended up um, encountering a diagnosis of teratoma 
and became really fascinated with it. Um, I thought it was just absolutely wild that ovarian tumors could have teeth and hair and mature tissues and still be benign. And um, it blew my mind and um, really fascinated me and provoked my first interest in GYN pathology. And I actually you know, came into residency thinking I wanted to study ovarian tumors. Um, but there'll be more on that, I think, with one of your subsequent questions. <laughs> Yeah, so you uh, had a very interesting path towards UIN pathology. If you had to talk to a junior resident or um, incoming medical student about what makes UIN pathology so unique among other specialties, what would you tell them? Yeah, well, for one thing, it's a reasonably high volume service. So you're going to be valuable in a variety of practice settings, right? You can easily find a subspecialty job in UN pathology if that appeals to you, but you'll also be very valuable in a general practice setting where GYN will undoubtedly comprise a significant proportion of most workloads in most settings. Um, so from a practical standpoint, I think it's a very valuable and a very marketable skill. I also just think that the gyne tract makes more varied and more interesting tumors than many other organ sites. I'm not going to belittle any other organs, but I just think we have more fun and interesting diagnoses to render. Um, there's also a lot of excitement in what we are learning about GYN pathology. You know, the exponential growth in molecular classification in my, my professional lifetime has been huge. With that is an increasing role for predictive biomarkers. And so I think it's just a very fulfilling time. So you're not only useful in your diagnostic ability, you're also now increasingly useful in um, guiding patient care in, in GYN path because of all of the really neat predictive biomarkers that we have. So um, I'm also just passionate about women's health. You know, I think a lot of us um, are in this field because we've always, you know, wanted to be involved in the care of people with uteruses, um, people with ovaries, because often this is a population who um, has historically not gotten the best care for a variety of reasons, resources, um, in access. And so I think that if you take care of women, the dividends culturally and to the community um, can be really quite high. So I like that about the job too. That's great. That's just like, I echo so many of the feelings that you represented here. Um, but you did talk about the case, the teratoma case that you encountered in while running the library, the volunteer library. I'm also curious, like after you started your career in pathology, did you come across any case that just stuck with you and has been like something you've been just thinking about often again and again? So. Yeah, sure. I, I can talk about a couple cases actually. So one story that I really, really love, um, ties into one of my mentors, um, Terry Longacre. So when I was a junior resident, um, I told Dr. Longacre that I really wanted to study Joanne pathology, specifically ovarian cancer. And she looked at me and she said, there's nothing for you in ovary right now. And I was very taken aback because I thought, surely there's something to study in ovary. But really at the time, you know, Chris Crum at Brigham had just described sticks, you know, 10, 10 years prior, eight years prior or so. And um, that had really provoked a ton of investigation. The work had really been very thoroughly done. Dr. Longacre and her colleagues had done a ton of work in borderline tumors. The folks at Johns Hopkins with their collaborations um, in Europe had done really gorgeous work looking at prognostication with borderline tumors. And, you know, that work continues now. And she, you know, rightfully, I think, recognized that there wasn't a lot that I, in my position, or we at Stanford with our case volumes, could add that wasn't already cooking with somebody else. And so she said, you know, you need to work on other things. And um, the main thing she wanted to point me towards was endometrial carcinoma, because she got a sense that there was this huge molecular revolution coming there. And I'll talk more about that later if you all want. But um, she also was just keeping her eyes out for mesenchymal things for me to, to study. And so one day when I was a very junior resident, I think I was in my second year, she said, I got these cases. They're funny. I don't know what they are. Let's study them. And uh, she slapped three cases on my desk and they were these spindle tumors in the cervixes of younger women predominantly. I think one of the women was a bit older, but they had a range and they included some, you know, you know middle-aged and um, sort of younger edge women. 
and they were super aggressive. Um, at least two of them were super aggressive. And we described them and we wrote a paper describing them on the basis of the fact that they had this unique, um, fairly monotonous look to them, right? And we, we now when we think about monotony in, a, in any tumor, we think this must be a genetically simple tumor. And so there's oh. probably some sort of signature to this tumor. Um, and we thought we thought that may be true at the time, but we didn't have the technology to prove it back then. Um, but we could describe what we saw and we could do our, you know, immunostains. And so we stained these spindled tumors up and they um, expressed to varying degrees S100 and CD34. So we described them, thought they were interesting. We had this sort of fanciful notion about um, maybe they had some sort of relationship to the endomerium. Um, maybe they were sort of related to MPNSTs. Um, we called them fibrosarcomas, um, but like we had a special name for them um, on the basis of the fact that they had this sort of like maybe endoneurial phenotype and described it and finally got that published around 2011. I think I dragged my feet a little bit because I was studying or whatnot, but um, presented it at ASCAP. It was cute. Life goes on, right? And so years go by and I thought, well, that was a silly little paper that I could never get published now because molecular knowledge has exploded and you can't just write observational immunohistochemical studies anymore. But I still think think that it contributed some value because as this molecular revolution was unfolding in GUN pathology, um, somebody read the paper, um, I guess a few people, including Sabina Kroos out in group of GUN pathologists, um, was meanwhile uh, working with molecular classification of some sarcomas in the cervix as well as in the uterus um, around the same time that Sarah Chang and the Memorial Sloan Kettering group were doing the same. And both studies found NTREC rearrangements. And our um, cases were actually um, included. We contributed them to the European study um, and did, in fact, help identify that there was this recur you know, reoccurring rearrangements in NTREC that helped define some of these spindle tumors. So I really like those cases because I think it illustrates that um, you can, you know, make a difference even with small early morphologic and immunohistochemical observations. And while independently the impact may be small, ultimately it may tie into a much more significant reclassification. And so I, I like that story a lot um, because it really spans the time of my early residency to my early faculty years. Um, and kind of, I got to see the whole story unfold and, and be a small part of it. So that was very fun and rewarding. Oh yeah, wonderful. That's great. That's a great story. As a GYN pathologist uh, in your day-to-day -day, uh, job, what do you find is the most gratifying aspect? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I always think about medicine in terms of these sort of um, spectrum between uh, personalized and precision care and population preventative care. And I think they're equally important and equally satisfying. Um, and I love that you get to do both. So like sitting on my desk right now, I have about 40 paps to read and that is pre preventative medicine at its best, right? Those are tests that will hopefully help prevent these women from developing any invasive cervical neoplasias that at a different time in our history would have been the most common malignancies um, for women in our country and are still the most common malignancies for women in other parts of the world. Um, so I love that. That's super rewarding. Um, and then next week I'll be on surgical pathology and maybe I will see one of the unfortunate women who has, for whatever reasons, you know, barriers to access, developed a, an invasive cervical cancer. And I'll get to apply a pd one stain to that and potentially give her, that individual, a very sophisticated option that may help her. So I think you can get these two kinds of satisfaction. One is this sort of like big, broad good, and then the other satisfaction is from the like individualized um, good that you can do. So I, I really find that to be very rewarding. Um, I also, I like the investigations you can do that hopefully um, help improve both those, those kinds of efforts. Oh, great. That's for sure. Again, pathology is really interesting with the preventative and the prognostic diagnostic aspects of it. Uh, but how is the training like if somebody is interested in gain path? Is there a specific fellowship? Are there different ways of acquiring that training? And is there a board exam? 
Yeah, great question. So the GYN pathology fellowships are not um, currently boarded, so you don't have to take boards. Um, but there are a number of great fellowships out there, and um, they range from fellowships like ours, which um, can include other organ systems, like ours is a breast and gyne fellowship, but we tend to have more of a gyne focus. And um, that's in part because our GYN fellowship is actually funded by um, a generous donor from our population in our UVA G1 oncology history. And so our fellowship is really gyne focused, but it can be accented with breast if someone is interested. We also are a general sign out shop at UVA. And so we are willing to sort of weave in other organ systems if people want to get a little extra exposure to those um, during their training. So that's our model. Um, and I really like our model and, and find it fun. But there are other models that are really um, hyper subspecialized where you're just doing just doing gyne and you're looking maybe exclusively at consult cases. Ours is a mixture of consults and in-house material um, here at UVA. So there's different models and I think a lot of really great fellowships out there um, to learn GYN pathology. And, you know, it's kind of nice that you don't have to do a separate board. It's also not, these are not um, typically ACGME certified fellowships. So um, you, there's a little bit less rigmarole from the director side um, surrounding that. We still do all the things that our ACGME certified fellowships do with regarding tracking milestones and everything, um, but it's just not quite as um, paperwork heavy from that end, which is nice for the director, especially if you're also directing a residency program. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Bales, if a uh, junior resident or a uh, medical student is interested in GYN pathology, what advice do you have for them? Any resources that you could recommend and any societies maybe that they could join to sort of like basically put a step forward in the right direction? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I definitely recommend joining the International Society of Gynecological Pathologists. Um, so ISGIP is a great group and um, it's just a superb organization, tremendous teaching materials. They have monthly noontime educational sessions um, and you can even present at those. So that's a really great thing to get involved in. Um, you can, as a resident, present a case at some of those. Um, Jennifer Bennett um, helps orchestrate those and has done a phenomenal job with that. Um, so that's a great society to get involved with. If you go to the USCAP meeting, highly recommend joining for our um, companion society meeting for ISGIP. Um, and uh, I think, you know, anytime you're at a national meeting, <clears throat> if you can take advantage of whatever GWAN content they have out there. Um, obviously, there's opportunities for getting involved with uh, PAP screening. If you're part of the CAP and you get involved in the CAP, it's really nice foundation work with the C test treat program where you go into communities that have lower resources partnering with um, breast imagers and gynecologists and perform same day reviews of pap so that women can get um, biopsy the same day that their pap is uh, abnormal paps are identified uh, that's a great way to get involved in some boots on the ground preventative medicine um, that we do in GYN pathology. So if you've got access to one of those, the C-Test Treat programs, I think, kind of um, slowed down a little bit with COVID, but hopefully they're yeah. ramping back up again. Um, so that's a great thing to get involved with as well. Oh, wonderful. So I have one bonus question for you. Uh, since you are the residency program director, um, what is the, what is the, like, the, um, most positive thing about your job that you love as a program director, uh, residence program director, and what is the most challenging thing that you find? Oh, good question. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, so I've been a program director for three years now, and the coolest thing is seeing people's arc. And that was something that I really am only, I'm just starting to get to see that, right? Because I've, I've only been in the role for three years. That said, I've been involved with the residency program for long enough. I've, I've sort of always had a role in the residency that I can appreciate some of it from even um, before becoming PD. But watching somebody come in as a first year and um, get through at this point now three years and seeing just the exponential growth and knowing that it's coming for them, but knowing that they can't see it yet and sort of like being able to imagine how excellent they'll be when they're still in the weeds and thinking like, how will I learn all this? This is an insanely huge field. 
it's it seems insurmountable and then you can see it but they can't yet and then they get into that third year and they're like just rocking it and seeing seeing that progress i think is really really fun um I think the hardest thing about being a residency program director is that I started in COVID. <laughs> so um, I became residency program director in January of 2020, and I have school age kids. And so right around the time that I took a new huge job, my kids' school shut down and they couldn't go to school. And so in a way, being program director was a blessing because I was able to do some of that work from home. On the other hand, I and my my whole department is a very like community human you know human oriented like human interaction oriented place and so you can never do the whole job from home especially not as a residency program director and so while I could get a little administrative done work you work done from home the the human like having your door open being available for those conversations that aren't necessarily premeditated but somebody has a tough day they just need to they need to stick their head in your office. Like you've got to be physically present for that. And so I think the biggest challenge was in the first six months, my husband and I are both in medicine trying to navigate like these kids at home and trying to find safe childcare. We didn't, my parents live in town, but we couldn't physically be and share air with my parents for a year until they were vaccinated. So um, that was really hard. And, you know, I felt responsible for all of our trainees. Like you sort of become occupational health and therapist for, for a group of people um, because there were just, you know, resources in the world were stretched so thin at that um, period of time. So that was really, really tough. Um, and I think I love how our community weathered it and grew from it. Um, but it was hard on everybody. I think it's hard on everybody everywhere, but uh, you sort of step into a job and you realize you're looking for someone who has the answer and then you realize you're the person who has to have the answer. And um, it felt like that pretty much from day one. Um, but of course, no one had, no one had answers in COVID. And I, I think it was good for me to um, have to advocate for my trainees really early on, right? There were situations where maybe the health system said, show up at work, um, deal with it, you can show up. But we had enough bandwidth to say, okay, let's be mindful about this. Can we maybe lean our ranks in the in the in in-house setting um, so that we can kind of protect people from unnecessary exposure, um, keep a keep a group of reserve folks at home as much as possible. And um, that required some creativity and, and sometimes um, you know, necess not necessarily following the most um, permissive guidance about exposures from from um you know the, the more instant yeah. mindset at the time so that was that was an interesting um time <laughs> definitely shika do you have any more questions no i had a great time talking to you um and kind path seems even more interesting after talking to you <laughs> so well you never know you may find time for a second fellowship <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yep all right, uh, that's our show for today, folks. You can find Dr. Mills on Twitter. Her Twitter handle is at Ann Mills MD. And thank you very much for listening to us. If you like the show, please like and subscribe to our channels on YouTube, Apple, and Podbean. And we will be back with another episode soon. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Enjoy. And um, hope everybody has a great day. Yeah.